Welcome back to the 2 a.m. podcast. Today we have a pop up episode here in Beverly Hills with <laughs> our favorite guest, Kai Chang. Everyone, pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. How you? Uh, how you been? Well, this is literally the last day that I have access to this unit, so we're, we're doing it in my soon-to-be former home here in Beverly Hills. We're moving to Northern California, and uh, yeah, lot, lots. We we touched. We talked a little bit before a couple topics. Let's mm-hmm. l- l- dive yeah, into dive right whichever into whichever direction we want to go into. Yeah, I know. In a, the past couple of tweets, you've been talking a lot about um, parenting and yes. whatnot, um, which I am a huge fan of, and I think this is this corresponds with like my age and timeline as well. Um, with Zade expecting and everything, yeah. it's kind of like perfectly timed. So I thought, yeah. you know, maybe you should be uh, sure thing. So I think tell us about everything you've been tweeting. Yeah. So I think a lot of it of uh, or Xing. We're one of the things I think is most important, and as I'm thinking now about parenting, is thinking about when you're young. You think about all the ways in which your parents. All of us have imperfect parents, and we think about all the ways they dropped the ball, all the ways they fucked up, and you think about the time they were extra mean to you, whatever. And it's true, right? All of us are downstream of that, and it's and we fixate on that. And to be sure, you know, some of some parents are worse than others, but I think being a parent now, seeing that for whatever their faults, there was a period of your life when you can do nothing for yourself. They had to do everything for you, wipe your ass, feed you, figure out why you're crying, take you to the doctor. And for, and for months, years, you could do nothing for them. And that's something that, that's worth thinking about remembering that, there, that there's a long period of time. And, and I think being able to empathize with imperfect people trying their best in an environment where sometimes they're resource constrained. I realized that like my parents, like I'm in the middle of a move and I have this extreme luxury of having not just my wife, but also in-laws, my wife's parents who were very happy to help me pack, move, unpack my stuff on the other side, watch the baby. Like, and I, I have my own complicated relationship with my parents, but I said to my mother, I said, I realized that when you guys came to America, you didn't have any of this. You didn't have friends you can crash with. You didn't have anyone to watch me and my brother when we were moving. And your English was far worse than mine. So you had to navigate this alien landscape with less money, less connections, less resources, and, some, and somehow manage still to move from place to place to place, pack up everything, set up in a new place, knowing that if you screwed up and you had razor thin margins, then you just fall and that's it. That's the end of your story right there. Hmm. And it's something that it, it changes the dynamic of, I think, a lot of, of generational trauma. We don't, I feel like we end up not feeling as much we always feel the ways in which they drop the ball, but now you're like, okay, I get it. I understand because I'm struck. I've, I've never had it as hard, as hard as you, and I feel like I'm dropping the ball a lot. Yeah. Not intentionally, obviously. We're, we're trying our best. And I can realize that you were trying your best with even fewer resources, poorer coping mechanisms, less support from friends, family, and whatnot. And that's, that's it's a humbling feeling that I will never have it as hard as my parents, so maybe I should ease off and not be as judgy on the things that in which they drop the ball. That's like probably the most important thing. And also then, as someone who has more resources, more knowledge, better psychological tools, what are things we can do to build upon those wins? Because I think that, you know, we, we touched on this on conversation a little bit earlier that I think a very common curse of successful parents who have a bit of money in the bank is a temptation, especially if you grew up hard and poor, of I'm gonna give my kid everything they never had. <laughs> Which is a terrible mistake. We all, we all know the, the stereotype of the kid who grows up super rich, very entitled, kind of arrogant, and thinks that their parents' wealth makes them bulletproof, and then they piss away all their parents' money, and at the end of their life, they've got nothing to show for it, and third generation, it's all gone. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, how do you avoid this curse? How do you, that's, those are the things that are dominating a lot of my thoughts, not just like, I'm going to make more money, and, and then to kind of rationalize it as, it's for my kids, it's like, if you don't have a plan of how to spend that, it's just, it's pure materialism. There's, you know, Beverly Hills, there's a lot of places where you can spend like, you know, uh, $500 for a custom suit for your kid. Like, why would a kid need a custom <laughs> suit? But they'll take your money. They'll be happy to spend, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars on kids if you want, but does that improve their lives in any way? Just because you can afford it doesn't mean it'll actually improve their lives. And, and that's something that we, that, that, that I've been thinking a lot more about. Um, we're not in the position where we can just blow that kind of money, but it's like, if you could, and you think that you're doing it for your children, are you just doing it because your kids are fashion accessory? Ooh, my kid's got like designer, da 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 
And is that really for you? Or is it, does it improve their lives in any way? Does it improve their ability to build better relationships, to win the trust of good... Because ultimately, they're going to be their own men and women. Mm-hmm. Are they able to build alliances with worthy... Are they able to screen people, right? I mean, we all, I think by the time we're in our adulthood, there are people that we realize we shouldn't have trusted and we got snookered, we got lied to, we got tricked, we got stolen from. And how do you give kids the building blocks so that they are able to discern that sooner rather than just be soft targets for budding sociopaths to rip them off, to break their hearts or whatever it is that that await them in, uh, on adulthood. And so mm. those are things that I've been thinking a lot about is yeah. how do you not make them soft? Not, you know, I think a lot, you know, then you have this, <laughs> some people that are like, oh, I'm going to give my kids nothing. I'm going to spend all my money because they're going to, I grew up hard, they can grow up hard too. Complete That's opposite stupid. extreme, yeah. yeah. That's stupid, I think. Like, we, if you have an advantage, you give them a loving environment, it's powerful. It's, it's, the, it's a force multiplier to have caring parents that can afford to unlock doors that, that were inaccessible to you when you were younger. And I think that that's part of our duties as parents is to, is to unlock those doors for them if they want to go through. And also to make sure that we don't obligate them to. I think one of the things we, we had an earlier conversation on was, was my wife's family who they thought that they wanted to buy their way into a very prestigious school that she went to and rather than it being a benefit to her because of how competitive that school was, she felt that she was constantly being outcompeted. No matter how hard she studied, no matter how hard she tried, she was always getting the middle tier or slightly below average grades. And she was like the dumb kid in her class, even though she is objectively intelligent because it was such a ferociously competitive school. It's a prestigious school. And there are kids that are just simply going to imagine, you know, just hanging out with the children of NBA stars and basketball is the only yeah. thing. And the, everyone's dunking on you literally for your entire adolescence. And all you thought about was, yeah, you're the short kid that can't dunk for crap. How would you feel as a teenager? You know, and your, your confidence, because those are all important parts of being an adult too. It's not, it's not just simply raw performance, it's also how do you socialize? How do you find your own identity? If your, your fair identity is, why bother studying? You're gonna get your ass kicked anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ugh. It seems like you're gonna, you're gonna need a, um, a deeper intelligence in the same thought process as self-awareness. Yes, almost. for sure. For, for you to truly uh, dig deep in thoughts about this. Yes, so that's something that I think has been a lot of my conversation with my wife as on environment so that we're, we're trying to understand that. And then her parents, they weren't trying to be malicious. They were, they were good intention. It was like, here's, we have some resources. We can buy our way into a prestigious school. Why would we not use our resources to improve the future of our children? A mm-hmm. child in this case, there was an only child. Mm-hmm. Um, where, what else would we spend our money on? So even with good intentions, it can create some weirdly odd results. I don't know if you had a good high school. I didn't have a good high school experience. And for me, I think a lot of it came down to a lot of my own insecurities and the fact that parents kind of weren't there. And, and I think a lot of people can relate to that, the sense that we, the things we really needed wasn't necessarily a bigger, fancier house being in a more prestigious school. It's deeper relationships with people that we're at or near our levels that we can grow and de- evolve around people that we can develop relationships and friendships that will last for decades. I think that's a far more valuable thing than necessarily a stacking up credentials and then teeing up the next big thing. I got to do this so then I can get my admissions into this prep school, which then gets me into Harvard. And if I don't get in there, then everything. Did we ever talk about the, um, the, 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 the security gate next to Stanford? No. no. Oh, this is interesting. So here's an extreme example of privilege gone amok. Um, near Stanford University, there is a James Gunn High School, G-U-N-N. The high school is literally across the street from the Stanford campus. And because of its proximity to Stanford, every kid who goes to James Gunn High School applies to Stanford. Why not? It, you, you literally see it every day on your way to school. It's a very famous university, blah, blah, blah. And because of its proximity, its relationship to Stanford, they will take an above average number of seniors from James Gunn High versus any other high school. But they're not going to take in like half the class. It's going to be yeah. like 15 kids or whatever. They're not going to be like, the, whole, the, the class is like you know, a thousand, thousand or so graduates. And in that area, it's a very expensive neighborhood. So to, just to go to James Gunn High, you are already 
living in like a $3 million home. And even if you yourself aren't particularly privileged, literally your classmates, their parents are like venture capital partners, CEOs at major corporations, so top partners, 1%, yeah, top yeah. 1% of 1%. You want to start a business, you can literally have your business plan be reviewed by partners that make billion dollar decisions just for the asking. That's, that's what you get organically. Here's the weird part though. Every year, obviously, people Keep apply talking. to Stanford and most of the kids who apply to Stanford don't get in. Mm-hmm. Right from James Gunn High School, and as a result of that, there is a there is a train that runs from San Jose, southern part of the Bay Area, up into San Francisco. There's ninety nine percent of the train track is unprotected. It does, you can just walk on the you know the track is completely unfenced. There's one area that's fenced, which is right around James Gunn High, because every year when admissions letters go out a large number of suicide attempts are happening. These are kids that are at the apex of privilege, right? You go to James Gunn High, if you're applying to Stanford, you have good grades, you have high SAT scores, you have a lot of things going for you. But these kids, with all the advantages stacked against, stacked in their favor, they would rather die than explore their number two option. Like, okay, we get that this is your number one option, but you're 17 years old, your number two option is amazing. Your number 10, your number 20 options are all amazing. No, 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 I'd rather die. I'm 17 years old, and I would rather die than consider any of these other options. And that's why the parents of the school said, let's make it a little harder for these kids to just throw themselves in the track. These extremely smart, very privileged kids that they have this weird tunnel vision where it's like, either I get into Stanford or it's not worth living. It's not worth considering other just options. Just because all they've been around because is Because the pressure. Yeah, yeah, the proximity to Stanford. Well, anything else would just be failure. And I did all this for nothing, so I'd rather just... So they're extremely soft in a very important way, right? I mean, we've all experienced failures, you know, things you, you put a lot of effort into and it didn't get the results you want. And it, it sucks. It sucks to really want something badly and then not get it. But that's also a part of being human is to want something badly, fight for it. I mean, yeah. in competitive sports with soccer, right? You will rehearse, practice, get stronger, blah, blah, blah. And then sometimes... It's just someone else gets a lucky shot, and the, you, you you really deserve to win, and you want the other person just they just won through sheer dumb luck, yeah. or maybe you know you you deserve to lose. They just outtrained you and they kicked your ass legit. But either way, it just no matter what the no matter why you lose, losing always sucks. It's part of competition, but it's part yeah. of the competition, and that that notion I think is lost on a lot of kids of privilege because parents have spent so much of their financial resources insulating their kids from any hurt feelings. It's like, let's, you know, you're a smart kid. They were, they were told their whole lives, you're, this, you know, you're a super smart kid. We're going to give you every single activity. We're teeing you up to go to like a great school, you know. And we, by, by great school, we mean this great school. And any other option is like, I mean, I don't think any parent really says that, but there's a reason why. There's, there, you know, we can look up, put in the show notes afterward. Suicide gates are put specifically just in that area of Palo Alto next to the Caltrain station. It's insanity. Explicitly to prevent this phenomenon of 17 year old kids who would rather die than explore their second and third and fourth options, which are amazing, Yeah. right? I mean, like, think of how many startup people you know that would love to be on first name basis with multiple, like that alone is worth so much. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to do a startup, your friends of yours are working at, there's all sorts of options that, that are open to you, but, and that's a real tragedy. Imagine raising a child, feeding them, changing their diapers, encouraging them, and then because they did, they had the stumbling block at 17, They'd rather just end their life than explore any additional options. It, the, the the pain these parents must experience is something that would be really, really devastating. And it, it's kind of ridiculous when people who haven't achieved that level of success, at least financially, they look at these people who are quote unquote privileged and they believe that their life is just perfect. Right. Like it's they don't not, have any problems. Right. And the thing is it's it's a it's a hard and it's a weirdly kind of it's unrelatable, but once you're there, you realize it think about it's as unrelatable as thinking about somebody, you know who is in the third world looking at us. You remember, there's, what, two billion people on the planet that live on $3 a day or less. For them, the idea of, like, hauling around thousand dollars of equipment for a podcast, <laughs> unlimited access to fresh water, it's, it's an unimaginable luxury. Yeah. And yet, that's your life. You don't feel rich, but the reality is, to two billion people in the world, you are unimaginably rich. It, this is something that only like TV stations far away have. There's no way I could afford any of this gear. And for you, it's like, yeah, it's pricey, yeah. but it gets us better content and therefore it's worth it. It's an investment and, that, and hopefully you'll recoup with cost and, and make more of it. But that, even this, as middle class and poor as sometimes we feel, this is considered unimaginably rich. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you complain about your problems, someone who's living in the third world, like, what are you talking about? You get free, clean water all the time. What, you, you have no problems. All your problems are <laughs> yeah. fake and made up, yeah. blah, 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 whatever, right? They would, they would look at you and whatever problems you experience, whatever struggles you have, and kind of roll their eyes and think. So I know we're on a time crunch. Yes. Um, talk to us about this generational business idea that you've been floating around to us. So it, it's not an idea. It's, it's a society that I want to also get people to, to explore a bit further. Uh-huh. Um, it's called Lehekonian, and it is a French word for... Uh, it's the French word for Enoch, and it's one of the few people in the biblical story that... Uh, in this, the biblical story, Enoch lived to 365 years and then was taken directly to heaven without experiencing human death. And Lehekonian is a French society of which the membership condition is that you must be an executive running a family business that is 200 years old or older. And that's the condition one. Condition two, it must, you must be a descendant of the original founder and condition three is that it must be at least 51% owned by the family. You can have outside investors, but if you're like a subsidiary of a bigger company, you're no longer eligible. And so even with these insane conditions, there's like 54 members right now that are active dues paying members of this organization. So a lot of it comes, because we're talking about like how kids who grew up very privileged, they're soft, they're, they're fragile in a lot of ways that basically break that chain of success. Obviously in order to afford a $4 million home, send your kids to James Gunn high school, you're very successful. Like that's, that's, that's obvious. But that success somehow, it didn't even make it past one generation. You created such a fragile kid that they would rather die than explore number two, number three options. That's a deadline. And the other, the other curses that we, we've seen with, uh, with successful parents is the kid becomes arrogant and entitled. You know, my dad is super rich. And they sit, wait for their parents to die to get the inheritance. That's their entire mentality. It's just geared around waiting for parents to die. And here, clearly, they're, they've been able to raise children that are comfortable, clearly. These are profitable businesses. Um, and they've been able to not only... Inst- not every kid is going to be a worthy heir of the business, but they were able to build enough of a... basically a, a backbench of possible prospects and then select the correct heir for each generation to take over the family business to the point where now they're in their fifth, sixth, sometimes eighth generation running the same business, answering the challenges of a new generation while at the same time retaining ownership and never ever losing the family. And, you know, the, and the range of businesses in Lehekonian, one of them is Beretta. I didn't realize they were founded oh, wow. like 500 years ago. Hmm. There was a sake ma- manufacturing uh, organization in Japan that was founded, I think, in, in like like 8,900 or something. Like it's, so there, there are that level of, of that kind of dynastic. And so the, the, the idea, I guess, is that we think about, you know, we think of success largely as, oh, you know, I want to make a lot of money, whatever. And that's fine. Money's important. We're not monks here. But beyond that, it's like, how do you transcend? Once you're not around, all of money that you own would just simply drop into someone else's account. Yeah. That will happen by default. What they do with it will determine whether it stays in your family or gets dissipated forever. And sadly, a lot of fortunes that are inherited get dissipated. But these are people that have successfully retained it. And that, I think, is worth studying. So, that's, that, so the Hakonian actually they have a lot of essays and white papers of family members that they're willing to just talk about specific things. They have, obviously, internal resources that are meant for members, but there are a lot of papers published for outsiders to read. Like, here's how we handle inheritance issues. Here's how we scouted out prospective members um, for good heirs. I think one of the stories I really enjoyed was reading about the Laird Norton family, who they've, they are, I think, in their seventh generation. And they, one of the big things they do is a family gathering. Every, every, every uh, twice a year, whoever can be available, and there are family members that they spend the entire year planning these things. Oh, wow. And so they have gatherings, cousins get to meet each other, you get to spend time in, they have money to have like a compound. And so people come in from around the country and it's a whole vacation property. They even, they have an in-house publishing company that published a coloring book of family members, prominent family members. So all the kids in the family, this is not for public consumption. It's just a coloring book that every single kid gets when they're of age, talking about all of their ancestors. Like you're coloring it in you're learning about this is the founder of our family. We almost went to bankruptcy. This was, you know, great uncle so-and-so brought us back from the brink. This is the person that helped us go on the stock market, da, 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 whatever. And, and you have this sort of family history that's baked into the education of your own children. So the latest like Laird Norton group family photo 
there's this crazy like panoramic photo of like 400 living members of this family that are still showing up on a regular basis. Go ahead. Do you think that's the the real big insight from an 80,000 foot view is just the fact that the family's together and that yes. they can discuss these? That you can talk about it, because I think the, the contrast is a lot of people that are successful, they get very cagey about their money. It's like, look, it's a black box. It's like you're like the mafia you know, dad. It's like, you know, <laughs> don't ask about my business. Be happy I'm spending it on you. And that's kind of, but with that kind of attitude, it's definitely going to die with them, right? There's, if you don't know how they make their money, it definitely, none of the, none of the lessons they've learned, none of the mistakes they've made, you're going to learn from. You're just going to, whatever, whatever your dad dies with, that just drops in your money account, but you don't know how he got it. You don't know how he was able to expand upon it. You don't know any of the mistakes they've made. And so you'll just repeat all their mistakes and you'll learn none of their lessons. And so you're doomed to repeat that cycle. You're not going to be able to leapfrog past that and say, okay, I can now stand on the shoulders of giants, be able to get that head start, not just financially, but like intellectually be like, all right, yeah. I know that these are things, these are mistakes that, because you know, your parents are for all their flaws, you know, genetically you're 50% them and you're likely going to inherit a lot of their flaws and weaknesses. The more you can learn from them and identify and preemptively avoid some of their mistakes, the more you can make higher class mistakes. You're never going to have a mistake free life, but you can make a higher class of mistakes and then learn from those things that your children can learn, make even higher caliber mistakes. And then that's how you level up generationally. And I think that's mm. something that I wanted to, the, the, that aim, I think, being able to focus and think in those ways is what separates the generationally successful from just simply that flash in the pan of you've made a bunch of money and your kids don't understand how you made it and that they can't wait for you to die so they can spend it on whatever they want and then their kids are going to be broke and they're back into the dust again. Like That's a very common and tragic story that it's predictable because of the way most people treat wealth and the, the point is to kind of build it slower and set things in motion so that your descendants have the ability to to make moves that you couldn't do on your own. Like things that you learn too late because now you know about this, but you could have done this at like 12, 13. Well, that, that ship has sailed. But you can set things up so that you're a 12, 13 year old if they have certain innate talents, they can double down on it and sharpen certain things that can access worlds that you currently cannot. Yeah. There we go. 20, I mean, 25 minutes of straight that was Yeah, that was really good. Um, yeah, I mean, the, all, all the things like, that show up in my mind is like building an influence circle inside your, yes. in your home, you know, kind of like, because um, it starts really early, like age 12, yeah. for example. Um, and also, there's a thing where a lot of people don't mention anymore, and yeah. you used to hear this a lot, but my hero is my father. Yes. Yep. That's, it's, it's slowly vanishing. Yeah. You know, and that's, I think it's a really bad it's thing. It's tragic. I don't think it's just a successful person thing, but definitely, because you can lack influence as a successful person, which causes the hoarding, you yes. know, like the, the black box that you have. Yes. You know, and honestly, this was uh, amazing. Like, Good. This is a uh, really um, this helpful. Is 20 minutes? This is the most yeah, exciting <laughs> 20 minutes I've had a whole week, a whole month. This is the most well, helpful you're... talk I think we've had in a Good. very long time, you know, for our young generation. I would listen up and just kind of like keep this in mind, especially if you resent your parents or anything like that. You got to see what mistakes were made. For sure. You know? And... Uh, Learn to forgive future, them. Future episodes we'll have, we'll dive deeper on this. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, um, I'll be happy. I mean, this is not my last time I'll be in LA. I'll, I'll revisit. We'll have a thing in the studio. We can expand upon things and discuss these ideas further. But I think the most important thing if you're young is that learn to forgive your parents for the ways they drop the ball. Most of them, there's a tiny handful of malicious, but most of them, they're imperfect human beings. And remember, they were babies once too. And whatever imperfections they have, they're likely downstream of wounds that they carry from their childhood. And it's not to say that, you know, everything is, you know, it, it's not morally justified. It sucks. It sucks to have people that treat you badly, to be hit and whatever. These are all negative, terrible experiences and let's properly identify them, understand that they came, came from somewhere. Yeah. Nobody had like a happy, well-adjusted childhood and said, I'm going to beat the shit out of my kids to like mix things <laughs> up a bit, right? That never, that, that has yeah, happened never, up a bit. right? It's like, that does not happen. That all of the, the maladaptive behaviors are downstream of people that were grow, raised with maladaptive behaviors and they're copy pasting bad patterns that was inflicted on them when they were young, vulnerable, impressionable. And so learn to forgive them Give them the benefit of the doubt. Be gracious, and and I think most importantly, just 
express gratitude. I think that's, I mean, just to say like, because it's so surprising when, when, when people say, hey, you know what? I realized it was really hard to raise me as a kid. Thank you. And then they're like, all right, what do you want? No, no, no. I just literally, I'm not, I just want to say, right? Because you're, yeah, yeah. like, you're, you're teaming me up for something. You're buttering me up. What the yeah, hell do yeah. you want? Just, just try it as an experiment. I, I think most parents would be blown away. It's, it's, it reminds me of uh, Patrice O'Neill. He had this whole thing about how, like, you know, like, you know, ladies, tell your man sometimes, like, you know, just say thank you for like being with me. I know sometimes you're tempted, you see other girls, and the fact that you're with me, thank you. He, the man will be blown away. It's like, yeah. what? Because we never get thanked for that yeah. shit. So to be able to acknowledge something, because you know, as a guy, if you're attractive, you face temptation and you think certain thoughts, but you're not gonna act on it because you're an honorable man. And it's like, but you don't get credit for it. If someone gave you credit for it, it would blow you away. Yeah. Like as a parent also, like if you give them credit for something that is hard for them, that they're expect, expecting will never get acknowledged, and you just simply acknowledge it. Like, hey, I know that must have been really hard when you were in between jobs and you kept us all fed. And I know you yelled a lot in the house and whatever, just, but, yeah. but you still kept us fed. Simply that was amazing. Thank you. And that's it. And, and on that note, thank you, Kai. Cheers. You. So Pleasure. Much. Check out our sponsors in the description below. Use code 2AM for anything you need. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Awesome. <laughs>